Yeah, so how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, let me give people some background about you so that like they are familiar with you. Okay. Sure. So how are you all doing? Welcome to another episode of Sarah Bahad News. In this episode of her podcast, I have a special person with me, Anna Yusela. Did I get your name right? Yes. Okay. Um, Anna is a co-founder of We Encourage, has completed her bachelor's from Haga Helia University. Is that right? And uh, she also has knowledge of retail, visual merchandising, and fashion. I've been looking forward since we had a conversation the other day. I think you have some very interesting ideas. But before I get into any of that, can you tell us more about yourself? Yes, for sure. Thanks for the introduction. And once again, thanks for inviting me. So my background is indeed in retail and in fashion particularly. So I am a fashion designer from my uh, first degree and through that I have been interested in the retail and uh, how uh, kind of those uh, clothes can be displayed and uh, what's happening in the in the trends and, and such so I'm not the, the one who is so much interested in uh, creating the clothes or sewing and, and uh, the pattern making or anything like that but more uh, what's behind those uh, trends and, and the garments that uh, how, how those trends are emerging and how they are kind of globally adapted uh, simultaneously. And um, through that, I, I kind of uh, transferred into the retail space where I have been working from the uh, kind of uh, as a trainee, uh, doing my internship, uh, all the way being a shop manager. And um, then after I had been running a shop for a few years, I decided to uh, jump off and, and get back to study and do my um, uh, gr uh, degree on international business. And during my studies in Haga Helia, I decided that I won't go back into the corporate world, but I will start uh, my own business. And uh, I made the business plan on on a voluntary course applied a loan and uh, and kick started the the business with completely different thing what i what i was uh, then later on doing and um with with that i was all the time interested in in the trends as i mentioned and also the technology what's happening uh what, how how those uh technological innovations can uh, kind of shape the world and, and how they affect on, on retail, uh, what are the uh, possibilities that blockchain is bringing and, and the AI. So that was kind of the starting point, how I started steering towards the technology. Yeah, blockchain interests me a lot. And uh, as much as I know about blockchain, um, it involves like vanish of ledgers, and something like that but i don't know how how would you like incorporate blockchain with um your business we encourage can you just put a light on yes so basically that was the whole kind of ground base for uh, establishing we encourage because um i saw a documentary about an afghan girl and she wanted to be a rapper and uh, the long story short, the documentary maker ended up buying Sonita free uh, from her own family. And uh, today Sonita is rapping uh, against child marriages and uh, she's kind of uh, being the voice of those uh, being silenced. And um, that documentary made me very frustrated and angry, to be honest. I, I couldn't believe that still we are living in a world where uh, kind of if you are born as a girl into certain parts of the world, it's kind of uh, it, it's like uh, you you don't have any value. You don't have any human rights and uh, kind of the the future for yourself is to become someone's wife and basically someone's mother and uh, you you don't have any individuality in, in that sense and uh, <clears throat> I had just had uh, my second child, which was a, a girl, and uh, she was at that time, she was one year old. And it broke my heart to think that if she would have been born into another country instead of Finland, uh, it, it 
it could be her destiny. And uh, I couldn't believe that such a smart, intelligent, beautiful human being can be viewed as something as a burden and, and something that you'd need to get rid of. And that was a changing point in my life. And, I, and um, back then, it was year 2016, I was so much involved with uh, bringing up my children and, and bringing uh, uh, forward, taking forward my uh, company uh, at the time where I was teaching visual merchandisers how to measure, measure the effectiveness of visual merchandising, the profitability and such. So I couldn't kind of think of uh, starting something uh, involved with um, women empowerment. So I kind of postponed it all the time. And I was too scared, to be honest. I was afraid that I, I don't have what it takes. So it was all about fear of not taking action. But little by little, I, I couldn't get rid of the idea that I could do something. And um, at the time, I was uh, interested a lot about blockchain and AI. And, and I started to think that what if, what if we could use smart contracts uh, and smart wallets to incentivize these families who are um, usually economically disadvantaged? So uh, the only option for them is to sell the girl into marriage and by that being able to kind of uh, free up some space uh, and, uh, and kind of also save some money in, in the family. And uh, I started to think that well, if we could incentivize them in a way that it becomes economically more beneficial for them to keep the girl at school instead of this one-time payment, we could actually help, uh, help these families educate more girls and by that uh, give them opportunity to kind of grow up and be more mature before entering uh, marriage life and, and bringing up children. And this is kind of the, the whole starting point. And uh, I introduced my idea to this blockchain association here in Finland and a couple guys over there were thinking that it's a great idea. It's actually something that uh, it's not there in the market, and um, and I decided to join the pitching event that took place uh, in a couple of weeks. At that time, I had no idea what does pitching mean. I had no idea about startup world. I, I didn't know anything. And I went into the stage, uh, gave my pitch, told people that 12 million girls uh, every year are under threat of being forced into marriage. And the worst thing happened to me on stage. Uh, the, the first jury member who was kind of the honorary jury and, and a woman, she laughed at me. And she told me that, how stupid are you to think that someone would sell their daughter into marriage? And uh, of course, I was a bit shocked, not only for being laughed at, but for the fact that this is how ignorant people are. This is how much they know about this situation. So I kind of understood that I have to do something. I cannot just leave it here. Uh, luckily, there was other people in the jury and uh, they kind of encouraged me to move forward and, and, and take this mission forward. And uh, one of the ju jury members even uh, opened up his contacts to me and, and kind of uh, helped me move forward. So that was the starting point, but um, kind of in, in Finland, we have very strict fundraising laws. So it wasn't that easy. I couldn't continue and move forward with the original idea of uh, creating this incentivizing model, but we started to map out uh, what are the fundraising needs of uh, NGOs that are uh, in, in, um, in the square of uh, encouraging women and girls rights and, and such. So we started to investigate these, we started to learn about uh, their problems and pains that we interviewed them. And um, that by that time, we actually understood from those NGOs and, and people that we reached out that there is not so much actually problem uh, that not, of course, the funding is always a trouble and problem, but they had another um, more painful problem, which was that they they had the human operated chats and some services to help and support uh, violence victims. So those who are experiencing domestic violence and intimate partner violence, 
but these NGOs didn't have enough resources. They don't. They didn't have enough uh, skilled people to respond to the need of these people. And uh, we started the idea that what if we use AI to support these so that it could be there available 24/7 on their website and maybe accessible through the through the phone of these victims and they can chat and talk and get guidance whenever they need. And that was the starting point uh, of creating I Not Chatbot for victims of violence. Okay, that is very nice. And I'm very shocked that people are so ignorant to like, um, if a thing doesn't belong to their thinking, they think it's fake or it doesn't exist and just decide to completely ignore that. Um, next, I would like to talk about gender equality, freedom of speech, and importance of fairness or equality of gender. But before that, I would like to ask you, do you identify yourself as a feminist? Um, that's a tricky thing um, because there is a lot of good in, in feminism, but also I'm more into kind of thinking that we should have equality, the balance. So uh, I'm a bit afraid that if you are too much kind of uh, concentrating on pure feminism, it needs to have the kind of opposite thing, which is sovinism, basically. So then there is kind of like two forces that are trying to uh, fight against each other. And I would like to be in the middle because we, we are not only fighting for uh, women's right when we are talking about gender equality it means that we are we're more about fighting for the human rights and when we when we are getting the the balance between men and women then we are opening up also for those who are in in minority but if I have to choose I'm of course uh, there are feminism uh, kind of tied into what we are doing because we are uh, trying to get women on the same level as men and, and creating gender equality. But I know that there are also some black spots on feminism and it's kind of, uh, th there is, uh, it, it's not that easy if, if to identify either or. And, and that's why I would like to kind of go away from all the isms, so to speak. And, and just talk about human rights, because it's a basic human rights that you are being treated equally. It shouldn't matter, are you born as a woman or a man? Because it, you, uh, if you are a human, you have to have human rights. And this is kind of, it, it's beyond feminism or sovinism or any other ism. You are a human being. You deserve to be treated like human, no matter which gender you are or um, how you identify yourself. Is it a woman or a man? It doesn't kind of. I we don't care about that in that sense. We we want to have human rights for every human being. Yeah, I've also noticed that um, the moment people recognize their, themselves from a particular group, they start, um, you know, like fighting for them, <laughs> fighting for those groups and try to like, uh, for example, take an example of, of a pro-feminist. Um, they, would, they would like to bring feminism in literally everything that you can imagine. And that just make the whole concept of feminism in, in the minds of some people, um, you know, like boring or like very violent. So I would like uh, you to, like explain what is the importance of fairness and equality of gender yes so basically as i as i mentioned it's about human beings everything that we try and do is that uh, also those patriarchal cultures recognizes the value of women so that they they don't think that uh, if women are kind of uplifted and if they can enter the workforce or they get more education, that they wouldn't see it as a loss of something, that someone has to kind of give up on something, but that they would understand that it actually benefits the economy. And that's very important because when we think about Finland, we weren't the, that this equal as we are now, uh, like, 
hundred years ago, women were also uh, kind of under control of their husbands or their uh, uh, fathers, like in, in many other countries. And um, the, the thing that kind of gave us the freedom is that we were such a small country uh, going through wars and we simply couldn't afford to keep half of the population at home. We, we, women had to enter into workforce. And uh, considering that uh, where we have started without women getting an equal status, we wouldn't be here. And this is something that people have understood. And uh, that's why we are perceived as very gender equal country as well. So when we are talking about um, developing countries and, and those with uh, with a lot of problems with, uh, with uh, too much poverty and such, they should recognize the fact that when they start educating half of the population, it, it eventually results into higher economic status. And this is something that we don't hear, we are talking about it a lot, but we can see that people don't hear it. They don't hear it on the ground level. Many of the families who decide to not invest in the education of their daughter, but instead get the quick win and sell the daughter into marriage. It's kind of imbalance already because they, they only put the burden of uh, providing on the boy's shoulder, which is also quite big burden to carry because it's, it's also kind of uh, not fair for the boy, because if there could be boy and girl and both are valued and see, then it's double benefit, so to speak. Yeah, the whole crux that I find in that is that um, we should start looking at people like humans, not as a boy or a girl or a man or a woman. It would be better because like, you know, the moment we start treating everyone as a human, we do not see what one is capable of. The sky's the limit then. and. Uh, uh, I have a fact for you and all, all of the people who are watching this, if you don't know, the brains of a man and the brain of a woman are same and predominantly the female brain is um, like, um, we call the brain um, in clinical psychology as a female brain. Men, do, like, men doesn't have their own. <laughs> okay, you get the point. The, yeah, um, everyone is technologically same. We just have a like higher level of testosterone just that's the difference nothing more okay so i'd like to move forward on another topic which is the present condition of women in different parts of the world um like if you see in usa it is like a completely different scenario when you come to asia or maybe europe um it is still very different so i would like you to put some light on that yes um there there is a lot of different how women are perceived so of course we know that there is quite a lot of to do with the religion and and culture so when we go back until like ten thousand years ago before that most of the most of the societies were actually matriarchal so it means that women were kind of on the leading positions and uh, they were controlling um the the villages and women could kind of uh, be with whomever they want and uh, because they they carried the children they needed to kind of ensure that they have many husbands or or boyfriends or men so that they are being protected and provided and that there are many people taking care of the children but uh, when there was this concept of uh, starting to own a land. So be, when we started to become as a farmers, it meant that we are actually having some kind of ownership. And then it means that when we have ownership, we can also uh, inherit. So then uh, men needed to start actually owning also their uh, kind of uh, those, those uh, women so that they could ensure that the baby that the woman is carrying is actually theirs because they would be the one who is inheriting the land and, and or all that it's owner. So it, it kind of uh, 10,000 years ago, it started emerging this patriarchal society 
where women needed to be uh, at home and taken care of and men ensuring that the that the uh, Harris is actually theirs. And this is where it all kind of began. And, and also little by little, we started to move away from, uh, from the ideas of having multiple gods and, and these type of things to kind of steer it towards the patriarchal system that kind of started blooming 2000 years ago when the when Abrahamistic uh, religion started to emerge more and more so Christianity, Judaism and, and, uh, and Islam. And all of these religions actually took the old age old legends, those very, very old legends and started to form those into the into the uh, kind of one God uh, type of legends. And back then also the story of woman started to change from those goddesses and, and all of those, they started changing the legends towards more uh, suitable for the holy books that they were uh, starting to, to carry on and, and preach about. So we need to start understanding the kind of the continuum, how we actually have ended up here where we are, because this didn't happen overnight or even over a century, it has been taking uh, thousands of years for us to program our mindset of thinking that, okay, this is how women should be treated and this is where they should belong. And um, there has been quite a lot of things that have been done to, to females and uh, it has been taken place here in Scandinavia, in Europe, in all over the world where women have been kind of oppressed with the fact that, of course, controlling women's sexuality is, is kind of one of those most um, uh, kind of uh, most popular way of controlling the whole woman. If women don't get pleasure of being uh, having sex, it's easier to control them to become uh, just a child bearers. So then it goes to this that men control when they want to have sex and they just objectify the woman. And this is where we are at the moment. When we are talking about rape, too many times there is one or some sort of victim blaming. Okay, how did you look like? Where, why were you there alone? Were you drunk? And this might be something that we don't even recognize how we are actually talking about this. And uh, considering that Scandinavia and Finland is perceived as very, very gender equal, actually Finland is the second most violent country for women in Europe. We have a lot of stigma and, uh, and kind of uh, taboos around violence in Finland, domestic violence. It's, it's, those are not the nice and sexist topics that people like to speak about. And then when we go to more patriarchal cultures, for example, Latin America, it even kind of explodes. And um, we are in it together. So in, in that sense, because as, as I mentioned, the history goes so way back, even, even the story of Adam and Eve has been changed from the age old legend of Lilith, which was the first lady who said no to Adam and said that, no, this is not how we are going to do it. So then the holy book writers took and, and made Lilith as a demon and made Eve which is the, the lady who kind of confronts and, and says everything, yes. So we have to start understanding how we came here and, and women should start educating themselves more as well and, and see the kind of history, why we are here so that we can move away from this inequality. And, and because we are in it together, even though in, in Finland, we are perceived more equal and, and some parts of the world. So in, in Finland, we don't have the practice of forcing people to marriage. But then again, those who are immigrating to Finland from these countries that uh, continue this practice, it's happening to those immigrant background girls also in Finland. So they're disappearing from schools. 
even here in Finland, uh, female genital mutilation is still a worldwide problem. And also immigrant background girls here in Finland, there are thousands of them who are under threat or uh, going through this. So there are still these practices and, and widely uh, done and, uh, and, and we, we really need to unite our forces with all human beings to start uh, to stop these kind of uh, practices to happen. So inequality is it's, it's a real deal, even though it doesn't seem like that in your day to day life. Yeah, one thing I'd like to say about religion is like people expect religion to be perfect when it is made by men. I don't know why they expect a religion to be perfect because people make mistakes and if they're making religion, they can make mistake there too. So it is like completely okay. And they make um, like most of the people make religion cult or something like that. They start getting violent. Even if someone says something logical about it, someone is questioning, someone is trying to find an answer, still they will get violent because of religion. Second thing about uh, like objectification of women, I think it is because of sex education. Uh, people say that they are giving sex education, but if you go at the ground level, um, it is not 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 yet like you know in complete force. Like people like uh, teenagers are still getting those information from the sources that they shouldn't get them from. So it is still a very very big problem and. Um, most of the guys, like, I know, like, most of the guys in any country are, like, blank about when it comes to, like, um, talking to a girl or something like that, because they, they have got their information from the sources that are not allegedly made, or, like, they, sh they show all the things, like, in a wrong manner, so it is a, it is still a problem, and the, till the moment we keep sex as something that is hidden, the other people would try to find it, thinking it is something really, really great. So I think that's a problem too. And uh, with that, I would like to move to um, the next topic. First of all, um, do you know about the condition of women in India? Yes, I, I know uh, somewhat uh, that what I have heard and, and read in the news. So I understand that there is uh, a big, big problem with rapes. And, uh, and also I understand that there is also, that there is uh, areas where there is still this uh, child marriages taking place. And, and, uh, and there are, of course, there are areas that there is a lot of poverty. So then uh, these girls are unable to attend education. So I, I have a somewhat understanding of the situation, but uh, I, I would definitely like to learn more if you have something to share. Um, it is like very subjective, you know, like some people are very, very liberal in that kind of sense, like um, the place where I live, um, in national capital, there is um, very less cases of like, a girl is not allowed to study, a girl is not allowed to go out, it is like, um, maybe 30 to 40 years back, but now the conditions have eased up. Uh, exponentially, but still the practice continues in many parts of the country and here too, like, um, there is nothing which is 100% like, you know, pure or like correct. So it still exists, exists here too. And the cases of rape are of the primary concern because uh, I cannot even tell you what happens, what uh, is the mentality of the people here. And when we comes to when we come to the topic of rape particularly it is like very 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 distressing you know so <laughs> i cannot even like talk about it so it is like very harsh condition but when it's when it comes to equality i think um it is improving day by day okay um i, I have a question with that like in europe the condition of women is different in India, it is different. So the solutions would also be different here and there too. Like here it is mostly societal. I don't know about Europe much, but here it is like more of societal thing that needs to be changed. Um, 
the rest governmental and authoritative things are going like smooth but societal things like people what they have in their brains still needs to be changed like they're following a rigid structure which is coming from centuries and they have like um if you if you like uh, take an example of your parents or something like that um, you are trying to change the mindset of a 50 year old man he's carrying that 50 year old memories you're trying to say your thinking is wrong yeah. so it yeah people take that on the ego yes. yeah a great point because it's not even 50 years old if you think back it's kind of like from 10,000 year old way of uh, programming of people's mindset and yeah. you always have to consider the the cultural aspect and as well the religious aspect because it's uh, even though from outside in it looks like that okay that's ridiculous why are you even thinking about that but that's the belief system that has been built uh upon thousands of years so it's not that easy to change as you mentioned but this is again where the education knowledge understanding takes place so it's not something that i as an anna from finland can come and say to that 50 year old man that everything that you do is wrong it doesn't go like that because it, he has his own way of thinking and, and change is always scary. It's always scary because uh, when things have been going on like this, it, it seems from their perspective that all is good and this is how it should be. So, for example, what we do at We Encourage, we don't try to go and tell how things should be done or, or kind of uh, say that our way is the correct way. But we try to create the awareness and understanding as we started this, that we are human beings and, and we deserve to be treated equally. So when we start looking at it from the different point of view and maybe start questioning, is it actually like this that you are thinking? Could it be like this? What happens if? So if we could get into the state where we can actually have a dialogue, when we have a conversation, then we and, and the other part is also open for questioning and, and maybe for a different point of view, then we can start thinking that how we could actually create this more equal. What could happen? What could happen if more girls in this particular village would be educated? And they would be able to uh, enter into workforce, maybe establish a company and by that start providing for their family. So it would mean that not only the husband is under very high pressure of providing for the family, but the lady is actually able to do it as well. So it doubles the income of the family and by that they are able to um, spend their money on other uh, companies and by that generate the uh, kind of economic benefit for the whole village. So this is kind of where we start to question that is it really beneficial for selling the girl at one time payment into the marriage or would it be actually more beneficial to educate her? And then if we would be able to have this conversation and ask what are the arguments of this 50 year old man? What are the actual arguments? And if those are valid, then what can we do? Then it's it's how it's supposed to be in that area. But if we can see that there aren't actually valid points, if they're just stating that, yeah, this is how it always has been, or women are more stupid than men, they couldn't be able to do that, then we can show that, okay, well, in Finland, in Europe, in most parts of the world, this is not true. We don't have lower IQ. We we don't have kind of, um, as you mentioned already, we are actually quite capable of doing different types of things. It's old fashioned thinking and it could benefit uh, even yourself if you let your daughters to be uh, educated. So it's just to start questioning the status quo. Is it really so? Is it actually true? what you are stating. And we understand that um, religion is, is a big part of human being. And uh, we are not trying to say that it's wrong. But again, uh, sometimes uh, there is a need for reform. 
And for example, uh, in, in Finland, the, the uh, Lutheran ch church is doing quite a lot to reform and, and staying contemporary so that they are able to adapt into the into the needs of those who are following their faith. So, for example, we had to uh, go through quite a lot of fight with those who were uh, believing more in traditional way of uh, interpreting Bible by uh, discussing, is it OK to have women priests, for example? And then we had to discuss about the fact of same sex marriages. Is it OK to have uh, an, an uh, get them uh, having the ceremony in church. And because in Finland we are a big believers of equality, the, those who were following the older traditional way of faith, they had to back off. And the kind of we, we were allowing women priests and we were allowing same-sex marriages. So this is kind of where we are trying to showcase also the fact that things can change. And it's not end of the world, but actually it's opening up for more uh, diversity in our society. Yeah, so uh, what difference do you see in the solutions which will apply to India and to Europe? What are the differences in those solutions? And also, I would like to give you a background about condition of women in India, like uh, in ancient times and in modern times. So in ancient times, if you like read the books on the culture of India, uh, there was like mm, uh, very minimal chances of discrimination against women in the pure ancient times, the culture we follow. Um, there you will like, I will give you an example. Like there was like um, for voting in elections, there was like in many countries, fight for women rights to vote in elections, to elect a government. Um, but in India, that was not the case. We like, there was never a fight for if women should vote or not. It was like very inherited in us that it is natural. So the problem that I see is the modern way we have shaped ourselves. The ancient times, the ancient ways of women was um, at some places better than it is right now in India particularly. So um, I see the, like, uh, I'm a huge fan of history. So I see the problem in problem after British invasion in India and after the like Turkish and sorry, not Turkish, Iranian or Persian um, invasions in India. It was like very dramatic cultural Turn, up, turn around for Indians, like the native Indians at that time. So the culture has shaped that way. It got rigid day by day. So this is how normal India now functions. So I would like um, you to tell us the differences between solutions for women empowerment in India and Europe. This is very interesting and actually quite big and hard question because of course uh, considering that I I have never lived in India so I, I don't have enough uh, understanding kind of uh, telling or advising anyone in there but what I would say is to start going towards the the kind of the inner wisdom of yourself to understand the the kind of the purpose of love and the purpose of uh, respecting and uh, understanding that there are the, the other human beings deserve to be treated nicely. And uh, this is kind of, I think it's the overall problem of the world. There is too much hate and not enough love. So we, we need to start building more and more upon, first of all, self-love and self-respect because everything starts from within. Uh, I have I have read this marvelous book of Bhagavad Gita and I would uh, recommend everyone to, to start the kind of learning from themselves, to understand themselves first. Why do I believe the way I do? Is it something that has actually brought to me or is it something that I genuinely like feel and have from my inner self. If you are judging another person, 
are you actually judging it from your own perspective as it usually is or are you trying to prove yourself uh, correct so it's again we are treating with the ego mindset so i would i would go towards uh this is not so much about technological applications or kind of something that we can bring into this because it's about human beings evolving and uh, when we are living in this digital era we have so much knowledge around ourselves but we also have fake news hate speech we it's so easy to go into your own little bubble and uh, enforce all those things that you believe in so if if i want to start uh reading and, and going to the rabbit hole of Ganon, which is uh, now trending in in United States, uh, it would be easy to go there and, and ignore everything. So this is uh, kind of the, the knowledge and the information available. It's kind of also a backlash. So in, in, in this kind of uh, light, I would recommend everyone to start actually investigating yourself. Are you actually doing this because you want good? To other human beings are you what, what are your motives to start doing what you're doing and um, considering our world today i i this is i don't know i uh, th this can be discreet uh this uh, kind of uh disagreed but i believe that every human being has the similar chance to be treated equally if we just start perceiving them as human beings and nowadays we have so many opportunities for people to start different kinds of ventures to start different kinds of solutions that if you just have the internet access and if you have uh, reading and writing ability you can get quite far because there is so much free resources that you don't even need to start with uh, investing hundreds of dollars or thousands of uh, euros into anything but you can actually start by very little and and start creating a change so in that sense i would say that we we need to start first seeing the opportunities and understand the motives why we are doing things and by that we can then start uh, educating ourselves on the culture for example if we want to bring something into india what we first need to do is to understand the country and the context that we are uh, moving towards so i would also recommend that don't start with the with the tech you you can have the idea you can have the technology and and understanding what it enables but you first have to understand those people who would be using it and by that you have to understand that how would they be using it and and start kind of tapping into those people reaching out to those people who would be using them and ask from them and in that sense, uh, it's very easy to say it from our point of view, how things should be done. In, in Finland, it's very easy to say, yeah, yeah this, is, this, this would be the correct way to do things. But uh, to be honest, I know nothing. I know nothing because uh, before I have asked and educated myself, I can only make assumptions. And, and by then, I need to start kind of shooting down my uh, assumptions by reaching out to those people and, and asking, what is this that you need? And uh, the first step that I would take, no matter where you are standing, is to go through the inventory of your own motives. Why am I doing this? And uh, is it good for everyone or is it just good for me? I don't know if I answered your question at all. <laughs> yeah, it is quite like subjective. You kind of, mm, it is very difficult to answer until you are not living here. Yeah. Yes. Hmm. But the basic key is introspection, as you said it. We need to like find the uh, answers from ourselves. We all, uh, like we all are same. We need to understand what are our requirements. If we understand them, we can understand over 90% of requirements of other people. The problem arises when people start craving for status. Like in psychology, there are, or, or I will say evolutionary psychology, there are three things that drive humans in life. Um, it is also known as three S's. So it is sex, status, and survival. Survival being the primary need. Once you are done with survival, you need status or, um, or you need sex to like 
um, get your species species um, more in number, or like I will explain to you it with an example. Like, see, there is an organism or a robot. You tell him you will die after thirty years, and you tell to him that you have one way with which you can leave an offspring in this world, a copy of yourself. So why not he will do it? So it is like basically coded in our memory or like in every cell of our body that we should reproduce to continue our species. So after survival, sex is important. And when that is done, you need status because to like in psychology or evolution, we were monkeys. So monkeys needed to attract other female monkeys. So he needed that status to be different to differentiate himself from the other monkeys in the tribe. So that is still coded onto us and we still need status and that created the problem. So yeah, I don't know if you got it. Yes, I, I did. And and the greed, I, I feel the greed is the most kind of uh, worst worst thing that can be on earth that you start accumulating for yourself uh, without understanding that the more we can give to to others and, and yeah. the more we can uh, do it together the the more we all benefit and this is something that is too common that people start accumulating for themselves and and try to um kind of take advantage of people i'm i'm well aware of these uh, hard facts that many of the for example, Western products are manufactured in India in harsh conditions. There are children who, who are working uh, too, too long hours. And, and these are the kind of hard facts that if we would start providing for these people um, equal pay, good salary, possibility for these children to uh, learn and educate themselves as well, we wouldn't be in this problem. And the greed, for, for my opinion, is one of the reasons those companies and corporates which are doing that in for example india they are part of the problem because they could do better it's about this that is it um is it good to give shareholders uh millions and millions of uh, kind of uh profit uh instead of investing that into the society and into the ecosystem that they are operating in and and in that sense i would kind of highly, highly recommend all the companies to, to move their perspective and go more towards the social development goals and, and start thinking, how can we actually do better? How we can, because this is what uh, consumers are demanding nowadays. They, they are fed up with the greenwash. They are fed up with the fancy words on the website. They want real action. They want to see that those uh, manufacturing buildings are not collapsing on the, on the, next of the of the people working in there they they want to see people actually uh flourishing and and here we are kind of uh, into the situation where western countries could do a lot better and we as consumers we have the power to vote with uh with uh with the fact that we don't buy those products but it's it's hard to change because we have been now uh kind of uh educated ourselves it's it's similar thing for us to change as for those uh, men and women who are forcing their daughters into, into child marriages. Uh, similarly, Western people need to go from the ego and greed mind towards the, the fact that we have to respect these human beings who are out there and, and making these products with the less than a, a minimum wage. So in that sense, uh, also kind of, uh, demanding from the from the manufacturer owners that they are not agreeing with these conditions or terms and, and such so the, the greed is global it's it's not only in the hands of one or two person it, it has evolved like this uh during the times when uh when we started the whole uh, uh what was this uh industrial revolution so it started in in uh in western world and little by little, it was transferred into the developing countries because it was cheaper. So it has been going on for a century. Yeah. 
I get it. So now I'd like to move on to the possible tech solutions that you think we encourage can do or any other startup or company can do to like empower women. Yes, so there are a lots and lots of possibilities and I would encourage all of the girls and women to to start kind of investigating what's what's existing, what's happening in the tech sphere. Uh, I'm not sell, I'm not a programmer. I have been just educating myself that what's possible, how does AI function, how does blockchain function, what what is it actually? And then I started ideating that what can be done with it, how it can be utilized. And there is so many ready solutions. So we don't have to invent everything from, from the scratch. Uh, I would uh, suggest that people start looking and tapping into AI, uh, looking for the existing solution, testing them, looking at what's, what, how they are functioning, what's happening in those, uh, starting to educate themselves uh, with the courses, with the reading materials. There, there is so much. There is even this uh, free uh, online course, which is uh, created by Finnish uh, University about AI. Uh, so th there is so many resources. So if you are interested, just start um, researching, start uh, uh, reading about, uh, start building a network, start asking people who are already doing it, uh, reach out to them, go into LinkedIn and, and start following people who look like interesting um, thing and, and reach out to them, ask, how have you been able to do this? And, and kind of little by little start going into that space because what we are lacking of at the moment is the, there, there is already the technology is already there and there is a lots and lots of potential already. It's, it's kind of uh, evolved enough, but what we are lacking is actually the innovations. How can we actually utilize it for good? And um, especially women and girls are uh, kind of uh, not being uh, well enough presented in, in those fair because we, we haven't had the tendency to uh, be in, in the technological field, even though women were earlier, those who were actually programmers and, and such. But nowadays, uh, without the education, it's hard for you to enter into this market. But all of those who have, who have uh, understanding of reading and writing and, and can kind of understand and cope what they are reading, the most important ingredient is the interest. If you have the interest, start educating. So don't, don't worry about if you don't know how, start, start educating yourself and, and it will evolve. So AI, for example, is very, very interesting tool and it has a lot of uh, possibilities. What we are doing with it is that we utilize the AI to support and guide uh, female victims of domestic violence. So with that, we're able to uh, train the tool to understand um, different forms of violence. So when someone is uh, talking with it, it can understand that uh, we implement keywords and we do the labeling in such a way that it can recognize and understand that, okay, it seems that you are going to a physical violence. Here is a place where you can contact and then it can direct the person towards that help. It can give recommendations, it can give uh, different types of assessments. So there is a lots and lots of things that you can do with it. And um, as, as women are underrepresented, there is a huge opportunity to find new ways of utilizing AI. And one of the things that you mentioned is, for example, the sexual education. And I know that there is, for example, I think it was in Pakistan or somewhere uh, uh, that uh, area, there is this uh, one application which is educating girls. It's, uh, it's built by girls. Um, for educating girls about sexual health, about periods, about all of these things that are usually ignored or not educated so that they can understand what's happening actually in their body, why, why they are bleeding, what's the uh, uh, purpose of that, how it affects on their body, uh, what happens during the puberty and um, how they can protect themselves uh, from, for example, let's say uh, sexual diseases and, and such. So um, these type of things are something that uh, people might be even more comfortable with um, kind of discussing with a bot 
when you can ask the embarrassing questions from without being uh, talking with the actual human being. So this might be something very interesting for men as well to have some kind of technology that explains a bit about women, how we how we function, why we have these periods, what's happening, uh, what is the sexual health, and and how how can uh, what is kind of how is female body, and what are the the kind of um, the the reasons why women have different types of genitals than men and how you how you can uh, for example make more pleasure for women and similar thing can be uh, explained for girls so that they understand that how uh, male body functions and, and such uh, also e educating them about the uh, how, what it is if you are identifying yourself as a lesbian or gay what it means and and how you can kind of uh, cope with it, how you can talk about it and such. So there is, this is just one example that goes into the sexual health education, but there is other many, many types of different ways that you can start utilizing, for example, simply uh, an AI. And there is a lot of free possibilities to even create, for example, chatbots. You can just go into, uh, into the github and start educating yourself with different open source applications so i would recommend people to to start browsing looking for reaching out to people there is many many communities that are freely available very very much uh interested in supporting and helping each other so we are kind of uh in my point of view we are entering a new era and I, I would love to see kind of a renaissance, a new way of people reaching out to each other, communicating, having a communities that are bringing change into the society. And, and I already see that this is happening and it's happening in these technology uh, spaces, which are kind of following the path of uh, this Finnish guy called Linux, which started basically this uh, way of uh, open source, uh, sharing what you have, uh, giving opportunity to people, uh, reuse what you have developed. So we are kind of going towards this kind of uh, era. Yeah, as you said, interest is the basic thing that you need to enter in anything, like hard work and everything else just comes as a byproduct if you have interest in something. I would like to move on to the last topic of this interview how an average man understand better about the condition of women so would you like to put some light on that how an average man who is like busy with himself in his mind with his own biases how can he understand the condition of women i i would as as i mentioned earlier i would recommend questioning questioning the way things have been so basically starting to crack a little bit of the the surface that what if what if this is not true that i how i have been pro programmed what if women are actually as capable as men and uh, supporting women there is so much hate speech on 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 the internet and uh, it, it might be hard for men to recognize what women are actually going through we have uh, ever ongoing debate, for example, uh, on sexual harassment in Finland, which is a real deal. Women have to go through it. They either someone is uh, making remarks on their body or how they look like, and uh, they might be even touching. They might be uh, giving sexual comments. They might be uh, commenting on your breast or things like this. So. It's, it's kind of uh, already so normalized that many of those who are doing it for witnessing don't understand how it feels. It, does, it, it feels uncomfortable. So what I would recommend men to do is to start questioning, is it okay actually to objectify a woman and just think about her from the sexual point of view and, and start thinking that, if I would be seeing her as a human being, would I be doing that? And also similarly, uh, as, as women less often do that for a man, that we would uh, kind of comment something on his body or make him feel uncomfortable, they, they could do something to kind of 
uh, shift the perspective and think how would it feel how how would i feel if someone would be doing that if 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 you are already uh, feeling uncomfortable being kind of not taken seriously uh, there has been uh, many, many cases that, for example, when uh, a woman has been speaking in a meeting, it has been ignored, and then a man has said the same thing, and it has been heard. So th there are so many uh, little kind of uh, things that have been happening, but those are ignored. So men should be starting to take inventory that how am I actually perceiving? Do I see the problem or do I kind of ignore and uh, not understand it? How could I educate myself? How can I start listening what women are saying? And my friend from uh, who, who is uh, Indian uh, living here in Finland, she uh, told me about this. I don't know if it was a movie or a series. It was an Indian series where there were kind of uh, men were switching the places with women. So it was a comedy series where uh, men were behaving like women and women were behaving like men. So when you uh, shift this perspective, you usually see how ridiculous it is. And there is also this uh, Facebook page, which is uh, also switching the, the gender role. So it's uh, they are writing uh, stuff or on the page with the similar attitude that uh it's kind of uh about men but uh how women are being spoke about and it's it, it kind of pinpoints the problem very, very well because you cannot see it because it's so normalized that you don't even realize that this is uh sexism or or there is uh these uh kind of perceivance that we we think that for example women should be treated like this or this is women's thing and uh, this is men's thing and, and women are un, uncapable of doing this and, and such. So it's just to start cracking the surface, start thinking that are you actually part of the problem by uh, being silent? If you hear a, a man being disrespectful for a woman, you are part of the problem if you don't say to that man something, if you don't uh, raise your uh kind of awareness and and tell him that okay i think you are being a douchebag for for doing that for a lady uh similar goes to kind of uh accepting the the harassment or or behavior and and part of the problem is also when men don't support women who are uh stating the problem if they are being silent if they don't if they don't kind of stand up with the women, then they are part of the problem. Yeah, to some extent, I think that is also societal. Yeah, we need to change the thinking of the society to actually um, bring some change. And I guess what you're doing is very, very commendable because it is very difficult to change when it comes not to one or two person, when it comes to a city or a country or a worldwide scale. So. I think what you're doing is um, very commendable and it was very good to talk to you. If you if you'd like um, to give some closing statement, you can, otherwise we can just end it here. Yes, uh, I would recommend everyone to, to start doing what they feel like uh, should be done. So everyone is capable of creating a change. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye.